There are places on this planet that humanity was never meant to go, where the very environment seems bent on its inhabitants' destruction. Nowhere in all the realms I have visited is this more obvious than a relatively small piece of land jutting out of the Pacific Ocean like a cancerous sore, an island shrouded in a perpetual storm and that remained entirely uncharted until very recently. I am speaking of course of Skull Island, a region of extreme and unprecedented biodiversity made up of gargantuan beasts that seem to have only one thought, to eat. Of course, once our scanners picked up this extraordinary biome, there was simply no choice. It's time to explore this island for ourselves. I am Dr. Felix Nebula, and to you, dear traveler, I say, welcome aboard the dimension-hopping bioship Manta. As we descend, I ask only that you keep your limbs to yourself. These creatures tend to bite. I've detected a region that should allow safe landing. Engaging early alert scanning. That is good news, Manta, thank you. Now, our dear traveler, you may already be familiar with Skull Island, at least in principle. What you may not know is that this isolated region is essentially a geological portal into a subterranean world known as the Hollow Earth, an ecosystem irradiated with radioactive energy and stalked by titans. We'll have to leave exploration of that realm for another day, but I do believe it's important to keep that context in mind. The sheer size of many of the creatures on this island is a direct result of its proximity to this radiation. But fear not, my hull is reinforced well enough to protect us from any harmful energy. Whether it can withstand hundreds of tons of pure muscle may be a different story. I suppose there's only one way to find out, and we won't have to wait long. In scanning the nearby bamboo forest, I think we've picked up something that may have been nearly invisible to the naked eye. If you ever enter the bamboo forests of this island on foot, you must be vigilant. As one unfortunate expedition discovered, not every stalk is what it seems. The legs of Arachnidum nalum, known colloquially as the mother longlegs, very closely resemble bamboo. And in fact, even standing at a height of over 20 feet, this creature is a terrifying example of visual crypsis, the ability to nearly perfectly blend into its environment. These eight legs elevate its body above the canopy, allowing it to move and feed with ease, even amongst the dense forest. Scans indicate vascular bundles of xylem within these legs, which seems to suggest that these creatures actually incorporate elements of bamboo within their own physiology. Fascinating. Otherwise, are these just massive spiders then? One would think so, but in fact, scans indicate that they are actually a supermutation of the order Opilionis, an order better known as Harvestmen. These aren't spiders at all, but are arachnids more closely related to scorpions and mites. Hmm, <laughs> interesting. Normally, Opilioni species possess only two eyes, but Malum has eight, much like spiders do. Not only that, but we see a clear distinction of the abdomen and cephalothorax, tagmata which are actually fused in known harvestmen. Actually, it appears that Malum diverges from its relatives in a number of ways. First, there are the spurs located at the distal ends of each of its legs. Unlike typical harvestmen, which lack venom, these spurs are capable of injecting a potent toxin into its prey. This venom seems to serve a dual purpose. It immobilizes the prey almost instantly and initiates an external digestive process, breaking down the prey's tissues even before ingestion. The legs, with their plant-like veins, can then pull nutrients directly from their prey's body. Second, Malum exhibits another particularly sophisticated method of feeding. This includes a highly specialized abdominal structure with a series of interlocking segments that can separate, exposing its stomach chamber. From within, an array of fleshy tendrils are then extended, grasping its prey before being pulled back upward through a process of muscle contraction and segmental shortening. The abdominal cavity then closes, trapping the victim within, and beginning the process of digestion. There's something about this process that I don't like at all. That is understandable, but that's not all. For those prey items too large to be raptured, as some call it, Malum also possesses uncharacteristically articulate pedipalps, appendages terminating in sharp pincers, which are used to help cut up larger prey and funnel it directly into their mouths. What I'm saying, dear traveler, is that it's probably best to avoid the bamboo forests altogether. For now, let us travel to a more traditional forest.
Listen closely. Do you hear that beautiful melody coming from high up in the trees? It sounds like a bird to me. It does, doesn't it? But of course, on Skull Island, nothing is what it seems. It is actually the call of Cantus formica, also called a snare hunter or singing ant. Yes, that's right. Giant insects capable of producing sustained sound. How is this possible given that while birds generally produce sound with a syrinx, insects have no such organ? Manta, let's bring one of these into the observation bay. Ah, excellent. Scans indicate what I suspected. Snare hunters produce sound through a highly advanced form of stridulation. We see a more rudimentary version in crickets and grasshoppers, for example. The snare hunter's stridulatory organs are capable of producing a wider range of frequencies and more complex sound patterns, and even appear to be paired with a specialized tracheal system that allows them to modulate the air passing through, creating different pitches and tones. The purpose of this call is equally specialized. It signals the locating of a food source. So what you're saying is that if you hear this call, you might be on the menu? Yes, that could very well be the case. Fortunately, there aren't many documented cases of attacks on humans from a snare hunter. Like other ants, Formica is eusocial, dwells in enormous mounds and in colonies divided into a caste system. What luck! This particular specimen appears to be a Valkyrie, essentially a potential queen who has yet to become fertile. Actually, other than the queen herself, the Valkyrie is the only caste to possess wings and is very rare. As you can see, their underside is covered with bioluminescent spots which, while in flight, helps the Valkyrie blend in with the starry night. This is a fascinating example of what is known as counter-illumination, and is very similar to what can be observed in Firefly Squid. As you can see, and as with other casts, the top of their head is covered in mossy growths, and their antennae resemble dead shrubs. This level of camouflage allows them to lie unnoticed by both potential prey and predators. What are the other casts called, Doctor? Well, the smallest and perhaps most common is the Forager. At about the size of a small dog, they are tasked with exploration, locating food, and alerting the colony to potential threats. These are the ones commonly heard throughout the island's forests. Similar in size and appearance are the builders, which build and maintain the tunnels, as well as bring food to the queen, and are rarely seen above ground. Guardians stay close to the nest, possess thick, chitinous armor, and are quite a bit larger than the previous casts. As the name implies, they are tasked with defense of the colony. Finally, there is the queen. This creature is so large, reaching up to 130 feet in length, that some have suggested classification as a titan. The queen is very rarely seen above ground as her role is simple, to produce eggs. Only if the colony is deeply threatened will she emerge, and if she does, her massive, blade-like mandibles will make quick work of any creature who dares to attack. That is fascinating, Doctor, but I should remind you that we are on a strict schedule. Yes, of course. Apologies. Let us return this one to its flight and resume our own. There is a particular species that I cannot wait to find, and given its size, it shouldn't be too difficult. Now approaching the Bone Graveyard. Thank you, Manta. Now don't let that frighten you, dear traveler. The name of this valley may be ominous, but, well, I suppose that it is relatively frightening. Here, tectonic shifts have exposed thermal vents cracks that spew forth sulfur, methane, and heat that has given this biome a tropical climate even when the rest of this world was experiencing ice ages. It is here that we can find the infamous Cranium Reptant, commonly known as the Skull Crawler, arguably the most terrifying superspecies on this island. These bipedal hypercarnivores average roughly 30 feet in length and around 60 tons in weight but many have been observed to reach a massive 95 feet and 100 tons, respectively. Should we bring on a smaller specimen, Doctor? Uh, yes, I think that would be best. You have to admit, it doesn't look very friendly, and I think that's because it isn't. The skull crawlers are among the most vicious and voracious carnivores in this or any other Earth. Scans indicate the likely reason for this. Their metabolism is hyper-adrenalized, so much so that these poor creatures exist in a near constant state of starvation. This would certainly explain their aggression, which is unparalleled in the biological world. Now if this is your first time observing one of these creatures, you've likely noticed two primary aspects of their morphology. First there is the epidermal skeletal markings on the head, which of course is the source of their name. This is a form of dimatic marking, and seems to be designed to startle or intimidate. 
The reason for this adaptation could be because of an ancient rivalry with a certain large primate species. What appears to be two large, empty fenestry are meant to distract, as the actual eyes are located posterior. Like the orca, these markings may have arisen to confuse enemies by providing false targets. While we're looking at the head, note the multiple rows of serrated, razor-sharp teeth and additional tooth-like structures throughout, strikingly reminiscent of a leatherback sea turtle. Nature is truly amazing. It is, isn't it? Of course, the other striking feature of their anatomy is their complete lack of hind limbs, combined with a long, serpent-like tail. Its forelimbs are robust, however, and in adults, the elbow joint exhibits a large, bony spike. In terms of speed, the lack of hind limbs appears to be little disadvantage for these creatures, as they are highly capable runners, using their tail for both balance and support when necessary. In truth, this bipedal stance calls into question much about these creatures' taxonomy. Are they tetrapods whose rear limbs have vanished? Or are they an entirely unique group? More study will be necessary to determine this fully, but it does seem that some of this Earth's scientists have suggested placing Reptant under the Salamandra genus. So, they're amphibians? I'm not certain, Manta, as they seem fully capable of spending extended periods of time away from water, and there appears to be no metamorphic life cycle. However, portions of their skin are nearly translucent, and so one may assume that it is somewhat permeable, and like many amphibians, is covered in a thin layer of mucus that retains moisture. Furthermore, skull crawlers do possess a dual respiratory system, having both lungs and gills, so at the very least, they're amphibious. Now, as I mentioned previously, these creatures are virtually always hungry, and this makes them exceptionally dangerous hunters. Brain scans indicate an enlarged olfactory lobe, which is no doubt extremely beneficial for long-range detection of prey. Skull crawlers have been observed to exhibit two distinct hunting patterns, with direct pursuance being the most common. They often hunt in packs, a fact that indicates a higher degree of intelligence than one might expect for an amphibian, or even a reptile. But they have also been observed using complex vocal mimicry. Members of a particular expedition to this island once noted them making sounds like human voices in order to lure them. In any case, once a skull crawler has its sights on you, there is no escape. If their prey is small enough to be swallowed whole, the skull crawler will lash out with a long, prehensile, triple forked tongue able to grasp its unfortunate victim and retract into the mouth. It can do this with surprisingly large prey too. Much like a snake, it is able to dislocate its jawbone to accommodate food larger than its mandibular anatomy would normally allow. I have a question. How has this relatively small island been able to sustain such a voracious predator? Well, the short answer appears to be that it hasn't. Reptant directly originates from the hollow earth, and on the surface, their presence has had a devastating effect on this ecosystem. But now, let's take a break from the more aggressive forms of life found here. We'll move now to the open wetlands. If you look down into the lake below, dear traveler, you'll see what looks like an island near the shore. But as I'm sure you've guessed, that is no island. Let us approach for a moment, and don't worry, Scary Bubalis, or the Skur Buffalo, is an herbivore, and believe it or not, it poses us no danger. As you can see, these 40-foot, 22-ton beasts resemble an enormous musk ox, and indeed they are a kind of super biological bovid, though more closely related to the Asian water buffalo. As with this individual, these magnificent creatures spend much of their time grazing, submerged in the water for days at a time. Is that plant life growing from its back? Indeed it is. This is where things get really interesting. The skur buffalo is an example of what this Earth's brightest have called florofauna, a kind of fusion of plant and animal. These creatures' backs and flanks are covered in bony structures which in turn are covered in vegetative growths. But they're not just growing there. The plant's roots are actually integrated into the buffalo's own circulatory system. In a stunning example of advanced symbiosis, internal scans indicate that the buffalo actually possesses dual vascular systems. One is filled with blood, a traditional circulatory system, while the other is filled with what appears to be a fluid rich in both oxygen and chlorophyll. The plant's roots interface with this latter system, exchanging oxygen and nutrients, and is what enables the buffalo to remain underwater for such extended periods. It appears that the roots of the plants have adapted to this arrangement as well. Specialized structures, something like the root nodules found in leguminous plants, seem to allow for the transfer of substances between the plant and the buffalo without leakage or damage to the surrounding tissues. So if the buffalo has two circulatory systems, does it also have two hearts? I'm glad you asked. 
No, it possesses a single heart with four chambers, two for each system. Beyond the benefits already mentioned, this fusion of plant and animal biology also provides the Skur Buffalo with impressive camouflage. And with predators as vicious as the skull crawlers, for example, every advantage is, well, advantageous. But though they are docile, especially in relation to small creatures like humans, if pushed, their sheer size and 20-foot horns makes an enraged Bubalis highly dangerous. We had better let this one get back to grazing. Indeed. I hope you enjoyed this pleasant detour, because if all goes to plan, we're about to discover a less friendly species. We won't need to look far for the next creature on our list. Vultura insanus is an extremely common sight in Skull Island's night skies. With a wingspan of 5 to 9 feet, they are not the largest creature we've seen, but what they lack in size they make up for in sheer aggression. Bringing a psycho vulture on board now. Thank you, Manta. As you can see, the psycho vulture, as they are indeed known, resembles a very large bat with a snub nose, jaws sparsely lined with sharp teeth, and soft tissue patagium stretched across the digits of its forelimbs to form wings. And like bats, psycho vultures utilize echolocation, but interestingly, scans reveal that their optic nerves lack light receptors at all. Indeed, they rely on infrared thermal vision to supplement their hunting patterns. As you can see, their hind limbs are large and muscular, making them capable of standing upright as well as leaping into the air to begin flight. Like most creatures on this island, Vultura insanus is aggressive, even to members of its own kind, but their true meaning of their name comes from a particularly bizarre behavior. Psychovultures will intentionally seek out a particular species of pufferfish that produces a psychoactive compound, similar to the methoxydimethyltryptamine and bufotenin produced by the Colorado River toad. This produces an unparalleled mania in the psychovulture, causing it to actively seek and destroy any life form it encounters, regardless of its viability as a food source. This behavior has led scientists here to hypothesize that these creatures are the first non-humans ever recorded to exhibit signs of true psychopathy. But while Vultura insanus rules the night sky, the leafwing rules the day. To find one, we'll travel to the cool jungle highlands where they roost. Though like the psycho vulture, Icarus folium is abundant here. In fact, this creature shares a few similarities with the former, and whether it is related has been the subject of some debate. Some say that the leafwing is a subspecies of psychovultures, while others say that they are too different to be so closely related. Even the two binomial names reflect this disconnect. Given morphological and behavioral dissimilarities, it does seem unlikely that they are, even technically, the same species. Agreed. Let's discuss some of these. First, and most obviously, leafwings are diurnal, and though they boast the same patagium wings, albeit with a different bone structure supporting them, their wingspan is generally smaller at about 3 to 5 feet. In fact, leaf wings more closely resemble a pterodactyl than a bat, and indeed some have suggested classifying them, as well as psychovultures, in Tenotasmatoidea, a group of early pterosaurs. In any case, other than the wings, it is likely the bony, saw-like rostrum that causes this association, and the leaf wing uses the snout as a deadly weapon, slicing easily through flesh and bone. And as a species that travels in large flocks, even large prey can be quickly overwhelmed. Worse, it appears that they exude a waxy, epicuticular secretion from their skin that they then rub on their rostrum. This substance is a hallucinogen, so if the initial attack doesn't kill its victim immediately, this substance will likely severely disorient them, making them much easier to take down. Like some other species on this island, the leafwing is considered flora fauna, and indeed it metabolizes food through predation, as we've seen, but also through photosynthesis. How is that possible? Do they fuse with plant life, like the buffalo? Well, sort of. Scans indicate that their wing membranes are largely made up of unique, hybrid cells containing chloroplasts, the organelles normally found in plant cells where photosynthesis takes place, as well as chlorophyll, the pigment that absorbs sunlight. These cells convert sunlight into glucose, which is then routed via the bloodstream to be stored as glycogen in the liver and muscle tissue, providing a steady and efficient source of energy even when food is scarce. This amazing adaptation is absent in the nocturnal psychovultures for obvious reasons. Now at this point, we've seen much of the biological wonders Skull Island has to offer, and with a biome as diverse as this, there is always much more to discover. 
Sadly, this particular visit must now come to an end. As always, we will carefully return all of our specimens safely to their habitat. Manta, chart a course for the subject of our next study. Until next time, our dear traveler, feel free to take a brief respite. When you're ready, tap here to begin our next adventure. Brace yourselves. Beginning ascent in three, two, one.